A new Danish study shows low-carb diets are more effective at improving hemoglobin A1c and reducing abdominal fat than a higher-carb control diet. So what does this mean in terms of low-carb diets versus others for their efficacy? Well, it's one more feather in the cap that low-carb diets are a very effective and safe treatment for improving glycemia and lowering body fat. Now, there was also a reduction in lean mass. So is that a problem? Let's talk about it a little bit more. I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and this study titled Effects of a Six-Month Low-Carbohydrate Diet on Glycemic Control, Body Composition, and Cardiovascular Risk Factors in Patients with Type 2 Diabetes and Open-Label RCT was published in Diabetes, Obesity, and Metabolism. And this was an open-label study, right? So it's you can't really have it um, blinded to what they're eating, uh, and, but it was randomized. So these were outpatients with type 2 diabetes who were ra- randomized to either a low-carb diet or a control diet. They were followed for six months, and the main outcome was hemoglobin A1c with secondary outcomes being um, body composition um, and cardiovascular risk factors. Now, interesting, their goals in recommending the diet was to get less than 20% carbs with 25 to 30% protein and 50 to 60% fat in the low carb group. And in the, in the control group, 50 to 60% carbs, focusing on fruit, vegetables, and whole grains, and 20 to 25% protein um, with the rest fat. So both of these diets were likely improvements from what people were eating at baseline because focusing on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and increasing protein to 25, tw- sorry, 20 to 25% is a usually a healthier, better diet Um, than most people's controls. Now, what they actually ended up eating, the low-carb group ended up eating 13% carbs and showed 95% adherence at six months with the low-carb, which is really good. But interesting, the control group, 75% of the people ate fewer than the 50 to 60% carbs recommended. So they were more in the low 40s in terms of their percentage of carbs. So there was a sort of a smaller difference than what they expected or what they were hoping for, which is also interesting um, and shows sort of the control group, the control group was a healthier diet than their baseline. And in the end, the proteins were, the amount of protein was just about equivalent, 23% versus 22%. So it was lower than they hoped for the low carb and right on for what they were hoping for in their control group. So that's interesting though, because a number of the studies, and we wrote a guide on this, number of low carb studies that show effectiveness for low carb are also higher protein studies because those studies is naturally lower carbs and higher protein. Well, this one didn't. This one in the end, even though it was designed that way, in the end, the protein was uh, just about the same. So it really was the carbs that were the difference. And what did they find for their primary outcome? It worked. So the hemoglobin A1C, which averaged 7.1% or 54 millimoles per mole at the beginning at six months was reduced down to 6.1% or 43 millimoles per mole. Now, interestingly, in this study, they did not change the non-insulin glucose lowering medications, right? So insulin, there were only two people who were on insulin anyway, but for the majority of people, they kept them on their medications. And that's an interesting point because in a lot of other studies, they purposely tried to reduce their medications which can hamper the results, which means, you know, maybe you're not lowering the blood sugar as much as you otherwise could have because you're also trying to get them off the medications. This study didn't do that. They ended up lowering um, in about 20% of the people anyway for safety reasons, uh, but their goal was to keep them on the medications. And the control group had a much smaller decrease, not really even significant from 7.3% down to 7% for the hemoglobin A1C. Now, here's an interesting part though. The fasting blood sugar was not significantly different. And I think this is a really important point because the question is, you know, what are you testing? Are you testing something that's helpful and useful? And I think fasting blood sugar, although it's probably the most frequently tested blood sugar measure in our medical society, um, is the worst one to test probably because it can go up on people with low carb diets. But what's more important is what's happening the rest of the day. Because with low carb diets, you're not getting as high of rises. Your average for the day is much lower and your glucose variability is usually much lower. Those are better measures than fasting blood sugar. And I think this study really helped emphasize that. And it was very encouraging that these findings were um, were consistent out to six months. Now, what about the body composition? Well, that also improved in the low carb diets. Now they lost more weight in total 
um, and their waist circumference went down from 110 centimeters to 103 centimeters with no change in the waist circumference in the control group. And here's important. So it's not just if you're losing weight, it's where you're losing the weight. And the majority of the weight loss in this trial was in the abdomen. The fat mass loss was in the abdomen, and that is the most important uh, type of weight to lose. So we have a guide on uh, losing belly fat, and we have a guide on body composition, which really help enforce this with the science and the literature on how that is the most important type of weight to lose, that all weight loss is not the same. But this showed that, in, at least in this trial, this diet targeted um, the abdominal weight loss better, which is important. Now, there was also a loss of 1.2 kilograms of lean mass. So still the majority of the weight loss was fat mass, but there was some lean mass loss. And it's always interesting how to interpret this, right? Because with weight loss, you're probably going to lose some lean mass, but you want to minimize that. Now, it's hard to compare it to the control that didn't lose lean mass because they didn't lose much weight, right? They didn't. If you're not losing weight, you're not losing your lean mass. So, so that's not really a fair comparison. Um, the better comparison would be controlling two diets where you lose equal amount of weight and compare the body composition, but that's not how this trial was designed. The other thing is lean mass is also considered water. And we talked about this also recently in another trial on low carb diets and high intensity interval training, that when you initially lose weight on low carb diets, you're losing water weight. And that's uh, reflected as lean mass. So that's sort of a, a little bit of a weakness in trying to interpret what the loss of lean mass looks like. Also, not really controlled for exercise. So if you want to maintain or build your lean mass, the answers are, are clear. Increase your protein intake and increase your resistance training. That, that's not what this study looked, like, looked at. But if, you, if you're if you trying to synthesize all the data together, you could say, look, low-carb diets help you lose the abdominal fat, according to this study. So if you wanted to do that and improve your lean muscle mass, you combine the low-carb diets, you increase the protein, and you combine it with resistance training. That seems like the best possible approach taking this study and combining it with others that we know of. Now, the other secondary endpoint was cardiovascular risk factor. So interesting, there wasn't much of a change in um, blood pressure. There was not much of a change at all in LDL. Um, and triglycerides went down in both groups. Um, HDL transiently went up in the low carb group and then came back down, but there wasn't as big of a difference. And I think part of that is just both groups were eating better um, than they were at baseline. So that may um, complicate those findings a little bit. And the insulin levels, it went down in the low-carb group, but it wasn't statistically significant. That may have to do with sample size, but the, the, um, the magnitude of difference wasn't enough to be statistically significant, even though it was, did appear to be trending better in the low-carb group. So what can we take away from this? Well, one, excellent compliance at six months with the low-carb diet. Um, two, better blood sugar management um, with the low-carb diet when you're measuring the right things, and fasting glucose is probably not the right thing to measure. Uh, next, better body composition changes, fat mass loss, specifically abdominal fat loss with the uh, low-carb diet. But also, it, the control diet was healthier than their baseline diet too. So it wasn't just comparing low-carb diet to a very unhealthy standard American diet. It was comparing a low-carb diet to a healthier version of a higher-carb diet than what they were already eating, and the control group lowers their carbs as well. So pretty impressive findings for a six-month study for an open-label low-carb study, and provides more evidence that when it comes to treating type 2 diabetes, lowering blood sugar, low-carb diet is a very effective approach and something we should be talking about a whole lot more, especially since there was certainly no worsening of any cardiovascular risk factors in this study, which tends to be the big concern about low-carb diets. So one more article suggesting for all clinicians out there, consider low-carb diets for treating your patients with type 2 diabetes. All right, I hope this was helpful. If it was, please click the thumbs up and subscribe, and we'll see you here next time on Diet Doctor News on YouTube. Thanks a lot, everybody.